This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much, Christopher, for your introduction. Um, there is some logic as to why I ended up working on a surnames project. Um, it's a tenuous link in that I started off as an archaeologist, a landscape archaeologist, but I, I got particularly interested in place names in Wiltshire and the, the link between place names and archaeology. And I suppose my experience in place names led me onto surnames. So it's a tenuous link, but I sort of got into the study of names via place names. Um, and actually, my, my boss at Bristol, Professor Richard Coates, is um, president of the English Place Name Society and a uh, former scholar in place names. Um, and lots of surnames are from place names, as we'll find out. OK. Um, the project, the family names of the UK, or FANUC, um, to give it the, ac the acronym, um, it, it uh, ran from 2010 and is due to finish in March um, 2014 this year. So it's a four-year project. Um, I must say at this point that it was fu it's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and I believe it was one of the largest grants they've given for a, an arts project, a single arts project in recent years. Um, and it has um, a staff that consists of uh, Professor Richard Coates, who I've mentioned, an onomastician, he likes to call himself, I believe, which is somebody who studies names, a person interested in names, be they place names or surnames. Um, so he's the principal investigator. And then also, you're lucky to have Professor Patrick Hanks working on the project, um, a renowned lexicographer and the lead researcher. Um, and then uh, my position uh, for two years was as sort of project historian, uh, one of two research associates, and Dr. Duncan Probert um, has now filled uh, my shoes and is working there. And Dr. Paul Cullen, um, a, another onomastician who uh, has worked on place names um, formally. Um, Kate Hardcastle, who's worked with Patrick Hanks uh, on various dictionaries. And Deborah Cole, who's sort of coordinating the project um, administratively. And then we have um, a PhD student who I believe is, is just about to finish or maybe has submitted by now, um, but he's studying the surnames of Gloucestershire, um, well, the Cot Cotswold Gloucestershire, to be precise, um, rather than the Vale. So and as I live in Gloucestershire, I'm particularly interested to, to see the fruits of that. Um, and there are many, many consultants attached to the project as well. Um, so there's Peter McClure um, of the University of Hull, um, and he's uh, one of the foremost uh, experts on uh, medieval English surnames, uh, how they formed. Um, so he's a great asset for the project. Um, there's Kay Muir, who's the, the principal um, consultant for Irish surnames. Uh, we wanted to include all the Irish surnames um, that were common in the UK in the project as well. Um, and we needed someone with a particular Gaelic expertise. And also Matthew Hammond, who's looking at the Scottish surnames. Um, and also we have Welsh consultants, um, the Rowlandses, um, working in Wales. And um, there's Oliver Pardle, who's working in Cornwall, the Cornish names. Uh, and, and so it continues. I mean, there, there's Arabic specialists and African name specialists, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, oh, Indian names as well. Um, so all these people linked to the project and it's based at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Um, so I was trying to explain to Christopher, whilst we were having a cup of tea, um, how the project was born. And he asked whether it was anything to do with Richard McKinley's English surname series um, that was based in the University of Leicester. Um, sadly, no. Sadly, that, that project sort of more or less died a death. And I don't know whether it will ever be revived. I hope it will some, someday. But the, the birth of this project has more to do with um, Percy Rainey, Rainey's dictionary, um, Rainey and Wilson. Wilson came along and, and, and added, added to it. And we'll, I'll tell you much more about Rainey and Wilson's dictionary um, uh, later on. But um, the original concept of the project was to do a revision, an updated version of, it, of this dictionary. Um, but when um, Patrick Hanks and Richard Coates uh, looked at the dictionary, they realized that there were 
inconsistencies, errors, omissions. There are so many that you, you can't just update this dictionary. You need to basically start again. I mean, I mean it's an excellent piece of research, um, but it, it was of its day. And, uh, and it, uh, you can't just update it. You need to start again. So that's how the project was born. So the aims are quite ambitious. It's to, to explain the origins and the history and the geographical distribution of all family names in Britain that have more than 100 current bearers. Um, actually, you, you might think that uh, most surnames have 100 bearers, but actually it's very common to have a very rare surname, um, especially because mo most people's surnames are spelling variants of other, other surnames. And so you, you might, if you have a, a weird spelling of a particular surname, there might be only sort of three or four, five people in the whole country with that particular spelling. Um, so it's actually very common to have a very rare surname. So there are many, many thousands of surnames with under 100 bearers. Um, but a lot of them, as I say, can be linked to, to ones that are much more frequent. Uh, and also a key aim of the project is to bring together all the native surnames re researched properly and in one dictionary because, I mean, that hasn't really been done up until now. The English, the Irish... Scottish and Welsh surnames have all been treated differently by different people in different books and there hasn't been satisfactory coverage all together in one, under one umbrella. So that's the Irish, Scottish, Welsh, Cornish and Manx, Manx surnames as well. The Isle of Man has a sort of particular set of, of surnames. But also not only that, there's the, the, the immigrant surnames, um, including those that have been here for some time, so the Jewish, Jewish surnames. Um, that, that's, that's a real challenge, but really fascinating subject, and, and a lot of work needs to be done on that, really. Um, but there's also what we term recent immigrant surnames, um, so that's the sort of Indian, Urdu um, names, Muslim names, which is a sort of umbrella for lots of different countries, so Pakistani names, but they're all sort of basically Arabic in, in origin, and they occur in different parts of the world. Um, Chinese names, of course, um, that we've had a, a professor, a Chinese professor working, who came over from China to work on the Chinese surnames. Um, and that, that's, that's fascinating, <laughs> very tricky, because um, a lot of Chinese surnames are extremely ancient and are linked to ancient legends that go sort of back to sort of 6000 BC, some god, I think there's one surname where a god is supposed to have stepped in a footprint, or somebody's supposed to have stepped in a footprint of a god, and that's how the surname was born. <laughs> the origins of Chinese surnames are really fascinating. Um, but also, um, any surnames explained in Rainey and Wilson's dictionary, um, because we inherited the text of it um, in machine-readable form, and the text of Rainey and Wilson form the basis of the database, which we've expanded on. Uh, and many names in Rainey and Wilson's dictionary are actually extinct and have zero bearers. <laughs> Um, so, all in all, that's about 45,000 unique surname entries, um, what we call main entries, which I'll explain a, a bit more about later on. Um, and that includes about th 320,000 surnames all in all, including the variant spellings of the main entries. Um, so, the deadline is, is this March, um, and um, the, the the output of the project will be uh, an online database, publicly accessible database. That's the primary output. And we were lucky in that Masaryk University in Brno in the Czech Republic um, have been doing the, the sort of computer IT stuff. They're, they're world leaders in, in lexicographical databases. Um, there might also be a printed form of the dictionary as well. Um, so watch this space. Um, okay, I'll sort of run through quite quickly. Uh, I thought it would be useful just to have a, a, a general bit on the origins of surnames so we all sort of understand how they came about. Um, basically, before the, the Norman Conquest, um, people generally had given names alone, um, so like Ethelred or Athelbert. Um, but then um, some people, uh, notable people, acquired what we call by names, effectively nicknames, and that's what goes on to become surnames. Except the, diff the key difference between a by name and a surname is that a by name is not hereditary; it's not passed on from one generation to the next. Whereas a surname is hereditary, so that's the key difference. So there's famous examples: Edmund Ironside, Ethelred the Unread, Unready, 
Viking kings such as Harold Bluetooth, who I believe gave his name to the, the Bluetooth communications network. So I'm glad there's a link with, between Viking, Viking kings and modern technology. Um, also, and then, um, then by the time of the Doomsday Book, um, of course, a few Norman barons who came over with William the Conqueror had hereditary surnames. Many more people tried to link their surnames back to Norman barons. Um, many, there are many more people cl that claim they have Norman ancestry than actually really do. Um, but there are quite a few Norman surnames, and they're generally locative from the, the, the villages in Normandy that they came from. Um, so there's the, the Dormery family uh, that gives surnames Damery, 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 etc., from Dormery in Main et Loire. Um, there's also the Tony family, for example, uh, the de Tony, Robert de Tony, um, a uh, doomsday book from a, a Norman, Norman village, etc. Um, and I think, I'm sure you could think of, of many more Norman surnames. Um, and then um, by about 1200, most knights in southern England have, some, have a sort of hereditary surname. Um, so the, Bas the Bassett family, a nick an old French nickname meaning dwarf. <laughs> um, the Bassett family, and of course, that effectively, that comes through in place names. So Wooten Bassett, or Royal Wooten Bassett, as we're supposed to call it now, um, takes its name from the Lord of the Manor. Um, and the, I believe the Bassett family had Wooten Bassett Manor from about 1210. So that's how those type of names come through generally in place names. Um, and then we sort of get to the 14th century and the general, what, you re what you'll read in books on surnames is that sort of by the 14th century, um, uh, the majority of people in southern England had hereditary surnames. But I'm, what, what I'm about to tell you is, I don't think that's true. And I think that the, the surname forming process was still unstable until at least the 15th century. And in certain parts of the country, notably sort of Devon, Lancashire, basically the hilly bits of the north and the west, um, surname formation was a much more long, drawn out process. Um, so, what, okay, how, what are the categories of medieval bynames and surnames? Well, they're, they're generally divided into four categories. So you have locative, occupational, relationship, and nickname. And the locative names um, can be divided into two groups. So you have toponymic from individual places, so Swindon or Glanville, one of these Norman locative names. But then you have a, a wider sort of topographic um, category, so people who lived at the well or at the ash, uh, and the, the letters of at and ash quite often get fused, so you have Nash from at and Nash, and the N sort of gets a f joined on to ash. Um, you get it with roke as, uh, oak as well, oak trees. You get roke and noak um, from someone who lived by, by an oak tree. And de la mer, um, for by the sea, or to the lake, and that becomes Dalimore, de la mer, etc. Um, occupational, I mean, we all know what a tailor and a draper is, maybe, but uh, what was a rutter? Some, some of the occupational names are much more obscure and tell you about interesting parts of medieval life. A rutter was actually someone who played the rote which is like a medieval violin. It's a stringed instrument. So a musician who played a stringed instrument is a rutter. So it's quite nice that John Rutter is a musician. musician. Um, and then there's fuller, tucker, and walker. And all three actually mean the same thing, someone who, who fooled cloth in a fulling mill. Um, but the interesting thing about fuller, tucker, and walker is that they're very regional in their distribution. So fuller is particularly southeastern. Uh, tucker is particularly southwestern English and Walker is, is Midlands and North. And if you look at the distributions, they're really striking that it's, the, it's three different words for the same occupation, but in three different parts of the country. And the surname distribution reflects that. Um, and the sort of status names, so a sheriff or a reeve. Or, and a road, road knight survives as a surname from the Old English radnit, a sort of riding servant. Um, so that's, that's quite a nice one. Then there's the relationship names, so from given names. So you have Fitzpain, which is son of Paganus or Pagan, uh, which was a reasonably common medieval um, given name. 
And you have Anglo-Saxon given names preserved in surnames as well. So, so Athelstan is a surname uh, preserving Athelstan. Took is quite a ni nice one because that actually preserves the old Scandinavian Viking personal name Torki. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting thing that when you look at these um, surnames from old Scandinavian personal names, they nearly always are strongest in Norfolk and Lincolnshire. Uh, for obvious reasons, that's where the Viking settlement was strongest. So it's no surprise that these old Scandinavian personal names live on in surnames in East Anglia and, and Lincolnshire in particular. And then you get things like Maggot's son, <laughs> which is actually son of Maggot. And Maggot is a diminutive or sort of pet form of Margaret, so little Margaret. So the son of little Margaret. So that's the, that's the type of... In the poll tax, you do get ladies called Maggot. Maggot. Um, there's a very rare one, uh, Neem, which is actually from Middle English, my Neem, my uncle. That's a very rare one. You don't get many of those. Um, but there's lots of sort of servant type surnames. So Abbot or Abbots, the son, a servant of the, of the Abbot. Um, you would hope that Abbots are not having sons or daughters of their own, and, well, some, you yeah, know, passing on surnames, but you never know. Um, there's all things like Hodgeman as well. So, so Hodgeman, the, the, the man, the man of Hodge, which is a rhyming pet form of Roger. So you get Dodge, Hodge, Rog for Roger, things like that. that a lot of medieval nicknames are sort of from rhyming pet forms like that and Peter McClure has done lots of work on that type of name uh, their nickname so you have this uh, thing called metonymy where an object um, sort of stands for the the occupation or the, the particular trait of someone so you get the surname peppercorn which is interesting and you can speculate about what that might have meant was it someone who held a piece of land or property by a peppercorn rent or someone who actually sold peppers or peppercorns who knows uh, similarly garlic and hood uh, i mean robin hood might have sold hoods but we know that he didn't he was someone distinguished by wearing a hood so that, that's a very common form of medieval nickname uh, bread presumably for a baker but taught as well, taught for someone who sells tarts, another sort of baker, I suppose. And then you get the, the sort of occupational nickname. So my grandmother's maiden name was Bowflower, which comes from Middle English bolt flower, bolt floor, bolting or sifting flower. And Shadbold is a quite a nice one because because Rainey in his dictionary says that Shadbold can't possibly mean shoot bolt, whereas it almost certainly does. It's, it's shoot bolt, in other words, someone who was an archer, crossbow, shooting bolts from a, from a bow. It's almost certainly that. And then the sort of physical characteristics, so redhead, fair facts, fair hair, and taut again. You get this taut again. Actually, taut can mean sort of contorted, twisted. So you don't know whether someone with a surname, taut, was someone selling tarts or someone who is twisted and again that, that's common you get the same word meaning different things in middle english and it can have multiple origins uh, and then uh, behavior there's a big <laughs> a big and amusing category so noble is quite um, self-evident but pretty actually meant cunning in middle english so the word has changed in the centuries and then you get the sort of bawdy nicknames such as tip lady and shack lady someone capable of shaking a lady and in the poll tax, my, I was I'm very proud to come across Thomas. Oh, he's either sweet in bed or sweat in bed. And I'll leave you leave that to your imagination. <laughs> Needless to say, that hasn't become a hereditary surname. It's just stayed a, a by name. <laughs> but there's many more where that, that comes from. Um, I'll explain later that in the project. Um, we are using the poll tax data quite heavily, the 14th century poll tax data, which is um, some of the earliest and best um, evidence when you get um, surnames and also occupations as well. And it's interesting to look, look at the correlation between the two. In 1381, this is a snapshot of Tetbury in Gloucestershire, but if you sort of look down the list, and here are the occupations in Latin, uh, on the right hand side but you can see for example that John Bocker is a baker so he's doing the occupation of his surname um, John Butcher 
is a butcher, Carnifex. Um, Roger Fisher is a Piscator, a fisher. Thomas Flexmonger is a butcher, Carnifex, a fleshmonger. Um, going down. Um, Marshall, John Marshall is a smith, Faber. When, and Marshall is, is a word for, yeah, medi mean smith, blacksmith. Um, going down. Robert Skinner is a Peliparius, which is a Skinner, basically. Um, and John Spicer is a Mercer. Well, that's interesting. Might he have been someone selling spices? Quite possibly. But the, my point is, and also there's um, William Webb, who's a, a tech store. So a, a, we and a Weber is, is a weaver, basically, a tech store. So my point is that if you read in the literature that surnames are stable in the south of England by the mid 14th century, that's clearly not the case. The poll tax shows otherwise um, that people are do if, if people are doing the occupation of their surname, it's quite likely that they're just by names rather than hereditary at this point. And actually, if you look then at the patent rolls, for example, here's a few 15th century examples I came across. These are very common in the patent rolls. Um, so Thomas Smith, servant of Bustler of Spoon Street, Coventry, alias Thomas Goldsmith of Coventry. So he, he could be either Thomas Smith or Thomas Goldsmith. And then alias Thomas Bustler, late servant of John Bustler. So he, he also takes the surname of his master as well. So he's Thomas Smith, alias Goldsmith, alias Bustler. Uh, you can see that he hasn't really decided what his surname is. And then John Proctor. Um, Proctor is sort of an official, uh, quite often in a, in a church court, in a consistory court. Um, alias John Leach. A leech is a, a physician or a doctor of Southwark County, Surrey, and he is a leech, so we know that he's doing the p profession. So he's either John Leach or John Proctor. And then the, the last one is my favourite, uh, Thomas Ratchford. So he's fr presumably from a place called Ratchford or Rochford. Alias Draper, so he's one of us alias Cornish, and so you get occupation, you get his sort of um, regional affiliation, I suppose, Cornish, and then you also get the place name that he comes from as well, maybe, or his ancestors came from. So it's clearly, in, in well into the 15th century, people hadn't worked out what their surname was. Um, and then very briefly, um, I won't go into this in great detail for, for the lack of time, but um, it, the, the basic message uh, of this is that from the sort of 15th, 16th century onwards, surnames become a, a, an awful lot more complicated. And the biggest complication is introduced by parish registers and people, ri clerks, writing down surnames in, in the parish registers. And uh, all, all sorts of mangling takes place. <laughs> um, uh, George Redmonds um, has written a book called Surnames and Genealogy and if you want to know more about um, variations and, and the changes made in parish registers look at George Redmonds's work um, but here are some examples of so Henry Cream alias Grime Garthwaite alias Garforth I mean how does Garforth sound like Garthwaite but these sort of interchanges of place name elements are quite, quite common so Worth in, a, in place names meaning a farmstead, quite often becomes wood in surnames. Worth and wood are interchangeable. So, yes, complicated. Um, and then in, in Wales, um, surnames, uh, I mean, surnames don't form until very late, and they have a sort of patronymic system in Wales for a long time. So you were son of Owen, son of Rhys, etc. But sort of by the 17th and 18th century onwards in Wales, they begin to cotton on to the idea of hereditary surname. But they, but, but they appear earlier, in, in, when they get cross the border into, into England, um, the Welshman sort of, it's, it's, it's imposed upon Welshmen to take a hereditary surname. And so you get things like Price and Bowen crossing over into the Marcher counties, particularly um, sort of by the 15th, 16th century, 17th century. And then, of course, in the 19th century, lots of Irish immigration, uh, mainly to sort of Liverpool, County Durham, Cardiff, London, the obvious sort of industrial places. And you can imagine what, what, uh, what the English make of Irish Gaelic surnames. <laughs> so you get Brazil, for example, from O Brazil, descendant of Brazil. And one of my favourites is, is McCambridge. McCambridge, 
which is actually a mangling of muk ambrosh or something similar pardon my Gaelic but it's basically son of Ambrose which becomes Muck Cambridge <laughs> in English or just Cambridge the surname Cambridge it just drops the Mac altogether okay so now we get on to yeah, surname dictionaries and where this the project comes from to get back to the, the Fanuc project proper um, I mentioned uh, basically Rainey's work uh, was started I believe Percy Rainey um, who is primarily a place name um, scholar. He wrote um, the place names of Essex, for example, amongst other, other works. But I believe he started work on his dictionary whilst fire-watching in the, in the Second World War. Um, and it, and, uh, and the first edition was 1958. So you can see that it, it's, it's high time that some new work was done on, a new dictionary was done on surnames. I mean, there are more modern dictionaries, but to be honest, most of them are based heavily on Rady and, and Wilson's work. Um, R. M. Wilson um, expanded Percy Rainey's dictionary in the 1970s, um, but he, he introduced some problems as well as uh, he, he added a lot more surnames to the dictionary, um, but his contributions have proved quite problematic, um, and, and uh, that he, his contributions have needed the, mo the most rewriting and reassessment, let's put it that way, to be kind and polite. Um, and of course, yes, yeah, Scotland and Ireland and Wales, um, the Scottish surnames, there's Black's Dictionary, 1947, so you can see how long ago that was. Um, McLeisert's Irish Dictionary as well, 1957, and they're the basis of work on, on those surnames. And in Wales, there's, there's Morgan and Morgan, but also um, the two Rowlandses, Sheila Rowlands uh, and uh, um, her husband have been working on, on, on Welsh surnames uh, more recently. But there's an awful lot uh, more work to be done on Welsh surnames. And then uh, I should mention the Penguin Dictionary uh, by John Tipford, which includes several contributions by members of the Guild of One Name Studies um, who have contributed findings about their own particular surnames. Um, so that, that I suppose that this is the dictionary that's on the market that does have some new, new material in it um, to add to the work that's gone before. But... I think this is the key to understanding why more work is done. There are many problems with the existing dictionaries. Um, s number one, superficial guesswork, dare I say. that <laughs> basically, yeah, Rainey and Wilson's dictionary, and I'm not knocking the scholarship of the man, uh, well, two men, Rainey and Wilson, but they did occasionally guess. So Timin, for example, they say it's a diminutive form of either continental Germanic Timo or Old English Timmer, and the asterisk means that it's not on record as a personal name in Anglo-Saxon sources. So they're sort of getting and reconstructing um, ancient names. Whereas Peter McClure, um, working in Fanuc, has demonstrated that it's, it's a West Midlands form of Middle English Timmer, Tim's relative or servant. And the key thing is finding um, the historical evidence and it's what's called a deduced alias. In other words, when you can establish that one individual in the medieval records has the two forms of the name and the two forms are interchangeable for the same individual. So we know that Richard Timms in 1327 was identical with Richard Timmin. He's the same man who could be known as Timms and Timmin. So that's pretty good historical evidence, and it, yeah, that's why the historical side of this project is so important. It lends the weight to the, the theories. Um, oh, this is one of my favourites that I came across, Fee Halley, which is one of these extinct surnames that crept into Rainey Wilson's dictionary. Um, and they, they realised that it's, it's a Liverpool-based surname, and they sort of thought, oh, because it's in Liverpool, it might be Irish. So, but then they sort of let, they, they somehow associated Fee Harry with Fitz Harry, and then they sort of gave a random 15th century early bearer from Essex. And because it's from Essex, you can tell it's Percy Rainey's because he was keen on Essex and wrote the place names of Essex. So lots of early bearers are randomly from Essex because Rainey had a penchant for Essex. Um, so they give Thomas Fitz Harry as if that's got anything to do with V. Harry in Liverpool. This is, this is the Fanuc entry which I edited uh, for it. It is actually means son of the chess player, Irie, and I wouldn't even attempt to pronounce the Gaelic because I'll just make a hash of it. 
Um, but yes, I mean, it is an Irish surname that came over to Liverpool effectively in the 19th century. Um, so it's nothing to do with Fitzharry whatsoever. Um, and uh, the, the early bearers that we've got come from a, an Irish source called the Fiance that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, a lack of geographical appreciation. Now, this is a, a big thing that surname dictionaries, with the possible exception of Titford's dictionary, uh, he does give some regard to geographical distribution. Um, but um, many people have sort of ignored the geographical distributions of surnames, uh, and, and it, that's key to understanding them. So, I mean, Rainey derived the surname Rochester from Rochester in Kent. Well, that's pretty obvious. Rochester's a cathedral city, and you might think, well, yeah, okay, they come from Rochester. And so here are some early bearers, all <laughs> three of them from Essex again, mm, for a supposedly Kentish surname. Yes, interesting. Um, but then, if you look at the distribution, uh, this is from Steve Archer's excellent British surname Atlas, which I'll talk more about later, which is basically the distribution of people in the 1881 census. And you can see that whilst there's a smattering of people in the southeast, it's a very heavily Northumberland and County Durham surname. So it's a bit of a leap of faith to imagine that lots of people from Rochester and Kent suddenly migrated to Northumberland and County Durham and, and the surname ramified in there. And actually, if you look at the surname, the place names of Northumberland, there are no less than three, three possible places. I mean, there's a village called Rochester in Northumberland to start with. There's Rochester in Ovingham, um, which is recorded as Rochester, and there's a lost Rochester in Chollerton. So you've got three places to choose from. Um, and sure enough, it's very easy to assemble um, early bearers right from the 13th century onwards, um, showing that it's always been in Northumberland and County Durham. And you can see how it's sort of moved towards Newcastle and Gateshead, as you might expect that people have been drawn to the cities up there, to the urban areas. Um, so yeah, you can be, so that's easy. We can now discount, well, it, it, it's possible that some modern bearers might have ancestry going back to Rochester and Kent, but at least 90%, I would say, of current bearers of the surname Rochester are ultimately, ultimately from the northeast of England. That's, so it needs to be rewritten. And then Bullus, here's another, another good one. They explain it as one employed at the Bull House, and here is a Hampshire bearer, uh, John de la Bull House. Well, you can't really argue that with that. I mean, de la Bull House shows that it's John at a Bull House. That's fine. But then you look at the distribution, and it's nothing to do with Hampshire whatsoever. It's all, it's really primarily West Yorkshire. It's a, it's a Yorkshire surname. Um, and it's not too hard to look at the place names of Yorkshire volumes and find that in the parish of Thurston there's Bull House Hall, Bullus Grange. And you can see the early spelling so that by the 16th century you do get Bullus and Bullos in 1647. Um, so it's almost certain that the surname Bullus, it, rather than being from any old Bull House, is actually from this specific place. In, in West Yorkshire. And sure enough, Henry de Bollus in Derbyshire, basically next door, shows that he, this early bearer takes his name from a particular place rather than just any old bull house. It's from the place called Bull House. So you can see how Rainey and Wilson, it, it, they're not accurate. I mean, they're not ultimately accurate as to describing the real origins of, of surnames. They're a bit too general and vague. Um, and then here's a good one, Sax, and Middlesex and Surrey, so it's basically a London surname. But uh, Rainey and Wilson derived from an old Scandinavian Saxi, and they give some 12th century early bearers of people called Sax. Well, that's all very well, but actually, if you look at, I mean, I've already mentioned it's, it's a London surname, and actually, if you look at real people with the surname Sax, it's not too hard to find out where they're from. I mean, Carl Sachs, born in Germany in the 1911 census. Lewis, Lewis Sachs. I mean, if you find someone with the, the, the forename Lewis, you, you know what you're looking as a p potential Jewish person. Um, born in Poland, in Spitalfields, an area of yeah, Jewish settlement. 
Um, so it's clearly, I mean, so, so the English, uh, if there ever was an English native surname Sax, it clearly died out many centuries ago, and that the current surname Sax is clearly an anglicised form of a German Jewish, um, yeah, Sax, um, someone from Saxony. Um, so you can see how it's, it's misleading. Um, also, the, there's a lack of medieval to modern continuity of early bearers. Um, it's all very well and good to sort of give a smattering of very, very early medieval early bearers, as Rainey did, but you need to trace them right through, preferably to the modern day, but at least into the era of parish registers, the sort of 16th, 17th century onwards. You need to see the continuity of, of early bearers. Um, so in, in Rainey's dictionary, fair bane and fair bairn have two separate entries, one meaning beautiful, yeah, this, it, Rainey derives fair bane from Middle English fair and bane, bone, limbs. But why would you be beautiful boned or beautiful limbs? I don't know. <laughs> um, but actually, if you trace the surname through to the 17th century, you see that they were side by side in Roxburghshire in southern Scotland, uh, and sort of within a few miles of each other. So you get Fair Bairn and Fair Bane, and they're clearly interchangeable in the 17th century. So, and that shows through in the distribution that they're fairly similar distributions, Fair Bairn and Fair Bane. And so basically we conclu conclude that Fair Bane has nothing to do with bones at all. It's just a late spelling variant of Fair Bairn, the beautiful child, which is a much more sensible medieval nickname. So I suggest that that medieval fair ban bearer was basically a, a, a either a, well an error for fair bane or a spelling, a spelling variant. Um, I don't think there was ever a, a separate surname fair ban. Um, I won't dwell on this because uh, this is complicated. But yeah, there's there's oversimplification. Uh, lots of surnames with different origins are sort of lumped together in one entry in Rainey's dictionary. So, Ravenshaw, Ramshaw, Renshaw, all sort of potentially meaning dweller by the Raven Wood. Well, that's sort of etymologically correct in that all three, I mean, yeah, that all three come from a place name me meaning Raven Wood, Ravenshaw, effectively. But, but there are three separate place names to consider, one in Warwickshire, one in Derbyshire, one in County Durham. And then if you look at the distributions of Ravenshaw, Ramshaw and Renshaw, you can see that Ramshaw in particular has an a almost uniquely northeast England distribution, whereas Renshaw um, and Ravenshaw are sort of northwestern distribution. So basically you can now say that Ramshaw, with some certainty, comes from the County Durham place and you can effectively rule out, pretty much rule out Warwickshire and Derbyshire. So you can be much more specific. Um, it's not just any raven wood that these people come from, it's specific places <coughs> called, called that. So you can be much more accurate in your de definition. Then also, language of origin. For some curious reason, Rainey and Wilson um, took it upon themselves to derive surnames, medieval surnames, from Old English etymons. Whereas, I mean, the language, the period of surname formation is, is after the Norman Conquest. It's the period during which Middle English was spoken. So if you're going to look at an English surname, then derive it from Middle English, not Old English. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it's important to rewrite the definitions of English surnames as from Middle English or Old French. A lot come from Old French. There's also Old Scandinavian, which obviously filters through into Middle English. The sort of leg the Norse legacy comes through as well, um, and Anglo-Norman French as well. So these languages, rather than Old English or, or Old Scandinavian, which um, which Rainey and Wilson homed in on, uh, and then also um, there's many senses and uh, multiple possibilities. Um, I don't think Rainey and Wilson realised just how complex. <laughs> surnames can be, and just how many possible origins there are for one for each surname. So, I mean, top, they just give a short entry. Top from an Old Norse given name, topper. Okay, well, that's all well and good, but they don't seem to realise that there's a perfectly good Middle English word, top, meaning hair on the head or tuft of hair. And you can imagine someone getting a surname from, yeah, someone with a particular, a sort of distinctive tuft of hair might get the surname top. 
so you can add in a, a add in a sense already. Uh, there's also another perfectly good Middle, Eng Middle English word top, uh, meaning a, a ram, a male sheep. Um, so again, you can see how someone might get. We won't dwell on how someone might get the surname Ram, but you, yeah, we'll think. Um, but there's also a Middle English personal name top. Uh, which there's also an old English personal name to consider as well as a Viking surname Topper there might, there's also a p evidence for an old English uh, an Anglo-Saxon personal name Top to consider as well so the sense is it, it could be expanded and expanded um, and so there's an awful lot more work to be done um, and also lastly there's a great, very great imbalance in the coverage so 11% of the names in Rainey's dictionary were extinct by the 1881 census. So what Rainey did, what Re Rainey was a philologist and he, he loved collecting medieval evidence, medieval occurrences of surnames from the documents that he went through when he was writing the surnames books, I mean the place names books, so place names of Essex for example. He, he was collecting evidence to illustrate the origins of the place names in Essex. And so he collected lots of, of, of early bearers, effectively, for his surnames. And, and so he, he put entries in for, 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 for names that might have only been around in the 13th, 14th century, um, if they were ever hereditary surnames at all. They, a lot of them might, might have just been temporary by names. But he sort of put them in his dictionary because he was sort of particularly proud to have found, found, found it. Uh, so that's why there are so many extinct surnames um, in the dictionary. Uh, but actually, they, yeah, over 20,000 common English and Scottish surnames have no entry in the dictionary at all. So, I mean, Blair, for example, <laughs> I mean, a quite yeah, prominent surname because of our esteemed ex-Prime Minister. Um, and Critchley as well, a very common Lancashire surname. So Snedden, Pringle, Winterbottom, I mean, all, all very common surnames ha have had no entry. <coughs> In, in, in quite a few dictionaries up until now. And as I mentioned before, there, there's no dictionary on the market that gives sort of complete coverage of all the native surnames, so English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, etc. Uh, or even Huguenot, French Huguenot, or you know, Jewish as well, in these important categories of surnames that have been somewhat overlooked up until now. Um, and also, now is the right time to do surnames research because there's been something of a revolution uh, in, in both methodology, and that's down to uh, p particularly the writings of, of people like Professor David Hay at the University of Sheffield. George Redmond, who I've mentioned, is a, is a Yorkshire independent historian, um, but he's pioneered. He showed in his publications just how important historical research, detailed historical research, can be for understanding surnames. Um, so he's looked at Yorkshire, and I, I believe he's got a, a, a Yorkshire surnames dictionary in the press at the moment and about to come out. Um, and there's also uh, Turi King as well, who, who's, who's joined forces with George Redmonds and David Hay recently. And Turi King is a DNA specialist. So, of course, DNA is an evolving area of surnames research, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the future. Um, there's also the Guild of One Name Studies, um, people out there researching their, their particular surnames and, and, and digging around doing research and coming up with some really excellent research and ideas on the origins of those particular names. So it's important to tap into that source of, of information. And there's, there's also um, um, uh, Archer, Steve Archer's excellent uh, mapping software, which I've shown you many examples of already. Uh, for the 1881 census, um, you, not only can you look at distributions by county, you can actually home in and look at distributions by poor law union. So you can actually see at a sub-county level where the sur surnames were. And, and it's surprising that certain surnames are particular to tiny corners of a particular county. So you have a, there are differences between East Kent and West Kent surnames, for example, and you can home in on those peculiar surnames through this um, mapping software. And also, also, you might think by 1881 that the Industrial Revolution would have completely blurred the surname pattern because people would have moved all over the place to, wo to work in the cities and industrial areas. But actually, that's not really the case. It's, it's surprising just how stable surnames are over centuries, even through the Industrial Revolution. That's something that really comes out by looking at the mapping and the, and the, and the mapping distributions 
surnames are more stable than, than we might expect, which is a real surprise when you think about it, just how you know, it survives the Industrial Revolution. Um, but also the, the sources explosion. I mean, so many uh, um, sources are available on the internet now um, and, and searchable. On, I mean, you can do searches and bring up masses of evidence at the click of a button. Um, so you can amass all this data um, very easily nowadays, which, of course, I mean, Percy Rainey couldn't have dreamt of a, the days of the internet when he was doing his card index in the Second World War. So this is the sort of working entry in the FANUC database at present. When the database is, is made online, it'll look a lot more pretty than this. But this is basically how we work on the surnames. So this is a main entry. And in other words, Threadgold is chosen as the main entry, mainly because it's the most numerous. So you see uh, in the top right, it says GB frequency 1997. Um, we, the project has obtained uh, frequencies of surnames from 1997, I believe derived from the electoral roll somehow. I'm not entirely sure how. But there are 730 people in 1997 with the spelling thread gold, so it's the most numerous, so it's logical to put that as the main entry. But you can see just how many variant spellings there are. So, so, so thread gold has 64 bearers. Uh, Thread Gill has 149 people in 1997, etc. And then also you get the 1881 frequency from the 1881 census using, um, well, the Mormons transcribed the 1881 census, so it, the data is freely, freely available. Uh, and that's why Steve Archer used it for his mapping. And then also Irish frequencies as well, we've managed to get hold of. Um, and then also we put the distribution in, so, so we, we've used Steve Archer's mapping to put in. A, a description. Um, there may come a day when, when we can actually integrate maps within the database, but that hasn't happened yet. But it would be nice to bring up a map um, where, for the time being, we have to sort of make do with a, a, a verbal description. So it's thread gold, gold is Cheshire, Lancashire, Lancashire, and West Yorkshire with a bit in Essex. Um, and then you get, the, you get what category it is. So it's a nickname. So you get you know, nickname, occupational, locative, the categories I mentioned earlier. And it's an English surname, so not surprisingly. Um, so you sort of get a, a, um, a um, linguistic or um, national sort of origin as well given. And you get, right, so thread gold from Middle English thread plus gold. You get the Middle English words, not the Old English ones with the early bearers in a box down below and you get consistent sort of a good spread from the 12th century up to the sort of 16th, 17th, 18th century. Um, so yes, distribution, this is, this is, yeah, as I've mentioned, this is one of the key strengths of the project is integrating the geographical data. Um, so, I mean, it's how we know by looking at the distribution, is mostly how we know that Topless, Topless, Topliff, and Topcliff are all the same surname origin, because <laughs> you wouldn't guess it by particularly by the forms of the surnames until you look at the distribution. So you see that Topliff is sort of it's a much rarer surname, but it's basically in the same area as Topless. Um, and then if you have the the historical evidence to support that, you can then build quite a strong case that they are one and the same surname. So that's how the research sort of build, builds up, a combination of geographical and historical evidence. Um, and also, yeah, Pegden, Pagden, and Pigden. I mean, you might not associate all three with the same surname, but it's clear from the distribution um, that they all come from virtually the same area. And sure enough, there's Pigden Farm in Ninfield, Sussex. Um, that you can point to as the ultimate origin of this, this surname. And it's the distribution that really sort of suggests that it's basically the sur same surname that's changed its vowel two times. Um, and of course, there's the historical bit, which was sort of my responsibility to oversee the gathering of the, the, the historical data and the early bearers. So, I mean, yeah, Doomsday Book I've mentioned, but there's the sort of the obvious uh, medieval sources that we tapped into. So 100 rolls uh, are a good source 
um, a bit problematic, but um, but it, nevertheless a good source of, of personal naming in the 13th century. Um, patent rolls online, of course, close rolls online, thanks to British history online. <laughs> Plug for the IHR there. Um, a feat of finds online, there's this wonderful website called something like medievalgenealogy.co.uk or something similar, and it has an excellent um, sort of online feat of finds search engine. Um, that's a really excellent source. And then the poll tax returns, edited by Fennec, uh, and we were lucky enough to get that in, in a database format. Um, uh, the, the author, the, well, Fen Fennec herself, um, provided the project with a, a, data, a computer database form of the poll tax, which is a yeah, marvellous resource. Um, and Fennec is currently creating a personal names index of the poll tax, which is quite a difficult, a really seriously difficult task to do. Um, and then there's the International Genealogical Index, which is the, the, the Mormons of Salt Lake City, transcribing the um, parish registers, basically. And so the Mormons have given us 190 million records in machine-readable form. And uh, working with the, um, one of my jobs whilst I was at the project was to work with volunteers from the Guild of One Name Studies, basically trying to iron out the, 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 the transcription errors uh, particularly in par the spellings of parish names and the attribution of <coughs> parishes to counties, etc. Because many of the people transcribing them are American and come over from America to do the transcription. So they're not particularly a fay with English geography. Um, so yes, there are imperfections in the IGI uh, data, but by and large, they're a really useful um, source of information. And there's the Irish Fiants, which uh, the name comes from the, the Latin fiant literae patentes, which is how these documents begin. But they're a key source of evidence, sort of particularly yeah, 16th, 16th century onwards, for Irish names uh, in the Irish Pale, basically. And so that it's how you, the best source of evidence for tracking the origins of Irish surnames. Uh, and then also we, we teamed up with the National Archive, who gave us their online catalogue and the Prob 11 wills. Um, catalogue and early chancery proceedings so we sort of got extracted the name data from that effectively uh, and of course the censuses I and mean, I've shown you already how important the censuses are for particularly Jewish surnames you can track the arrival of Jewish surnames um, in the censuses because it tells you the census tells you the country of birth of the individual so you can see which ones come from Russia and Poland and Etc. So it's uh, and also you, you can sort of tell by where they settle. So Spitalfields, for example, is a really key area of Jewish um, settlement. And uh, just to show you, um, here's an example: Melmoth. And uh, notice how, it, yeah, in 1881, it's a Dorset surname. It's a particularly Dorset surname. But we're able to tell by gathering the early bearers we were able to establish that it, it was a Dorset surname right from the beginning. By, by 1327, Melmoth was a particularly Dorset surname. So it, it's been in this one county from the 14th century onwards. And also, if you did, it's only by having the early bearers and the medieval spellings that you can tell that the, or, the etymology of the surname Melmoth is from mild mouth, sweet mouth, rather than Melmoth, a mealy-mouthed, reticent or hyper hypocritical so I mean they have completely different meanings I mean one is is a pleasant nickname and the other is a derogatory nickname but we can tell that the earlier spellings are clearly mild mouth and not mealy mouth um, so we can effectively rule out meal mouth as the ultimate origin of the surname so this is the, why the early bearers are so important the historical side and you might say that Mealmouth, because it's in Dorset, it probably had a single family origin. Um, the, the DNA data, as well as the research of people like David Hay and George Redmonds, are, just, are establishing just how many English surnames came from single individuals or single families in the medieval period. I think, I think we've, we've really underestimated up until now um, the percentage of surnames that come from single individuals or single families. So um, just in the last uh, few sort of remaining uh, minutes that I have, I just want to share with you some of the gems that I personally worked on, um, some of the ones, that, the names I enjoyed working on. 
Um, so yes, yeah, slipper, for example, I came to this blank. Um, this had, I don't think it's, there's an entry in Rainey's Dictionary. I, it was a blank slate for me to play with. But um, this really, again, shows the importance of having the early bearers. So you can derive it uh, from Middle English slipen to polish or sharpen for someone who's sharpened swords or other blades and compare William sword sliper in the Wakefield Court Rolls. So, I mean, if you didn't have that early bearer, you wouldn't know that sliper can be a, a, applied to swords and that there really were really people out there called sword sliper. And then also Middle English slipper, having a smooth or slippery surface, compare Reginald slipper top and John slipper cop, <laughs> the slippery head. So you can see the name in action. <laughs> Slipper, yeah, some a bald head, baldy basically, um, and then also yeah, the lo a locative origin, Middle English slip, a slippery place or slipway, muddy place, um, a slip plus er, and it, it's it's a common recurring thing that where you get this topographic element uh, plus er on the end, these surnames are peculiar to Hampshire, Sussex, Kent, the sort of southeast corner of England. It is a particular part of England where these type of names were formed. So Bridger, for example, Brooker, um, things like that, a sort of topographical element plus ER. I don't know why it's regional, but it is. So if you find a concentration of, of these type of surnames in Sussex or Kent, then you know you're onto something. So sure enough, if you look in the early bearers, you have um, one in Chichester in the poll tax, William Sliper, and then one in Rumboldswick in Sussex, uh, 1379 again. Um, so because there's a, a strong occurrence of, of, of Sussex bearers, you can, you can postulate that, that it, it, it has this origin probably in Sussex. You'd like to find, the, the ultimate holy grail would be to find William Sliper, alias William at a slipe, at the slipe. If you know that the two forms are interchangeable, then you'll, you know you're onto something. That would be the nice thing to have. William Slipper, alias at, at a slipe. Um, oh, oh yes, this is just to mention that for these recent immigrant names, um, there's what we call stub entries being created. These aren't being researched into the same depth as, as native names, I suppose. Um, so Adelaki, for example, but, but we are able to tell you that it's Nigerian from the Yoruba language uh, and it means the crown ascends or um, yeah, crown triumphs, Adelaki. And we give a source as well so, so people can turn to the source and, and read about the origins of Adelaki themselves. So, so there are lots of these type of entries in the database as well. Um, the Guild of One Name Studies have been marvellous. So uh, Roger Goetcher got in touch to basically say that Goetcher is an anglicised form of French Gautier. Um, and the reason what we know this is because of the early bearers and particularly because of this chap Nicolas Gautier, a French immigrant iron worker mentioned in the Westminster Denization Roll in 1544. Denization rolls are sort of documents that record immigrants and people who are sort of given leave to remain in the, in the country, as far as I understand. Do correct me if I'm wrong, but that sort of what a denization role effectively is. So we know there, we have absolute proof that this man, Gautier, is a French immigrant and an iron worker, and it, mm, it's in the Sussex Weald. But also look, um, also look how Gautier turns up in Rougely, in the black country in the 16th century. You think, oh, iron working, black country, that's interesting. <laughs> so that's a, that's a real interesting one. Uh, Redknapp, I put this in, but there's no, yes, because nobody had looked at the origins of Redknapp before. Um, and sure enough, there are two possibilities. I think the first, I think sense number one, the nickname is much more likely than the second one. So if I was going to pin my colours to the mast. I think basically the origin of red nap is the red nap, the, the red-headed boy or red ruddy-faced boy. Maybe he's being chased for not doing his work. And <laughs> he's ruddy-faced, the ruddy-faced boy, servant boy. Um, 
And, and uh, also, yeah, compare John the red knave, red knave in the poll tax. And knave also means a boy or servant. So we know that sort of a red boy or servant is a valid medieval by name or surname. So if you can have a red knave, you can sure enough have a red nap. Um, but we can't rule that out that it might be someone from a red hillock. But, uh, but also the un interesting thing is, if you look at the distribution at the top, it, it's a, primarily a London surname, also Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire. And I think it's interesting that in the early bearers, uh, William Redknapp, 1467, in the close rolls in London, and then Edmund Redknapp, citizen and merchant of L London in 1468. And maybe they've stayed around in London from the 15th century onwards. And that's why it's a London surname. That's, that's, I think that's interesting. Sterlicher, this is a good one. This is a, this is a blank entry. But the distribution, I mean, it's not just Lancashire. It's particularly Preston Poor Law Union in Lancashire. You can really home in on that particular area for the distribution. And sure enough, when you research it, you find that that's the where it comes from. And it hasn't moved between the medieval period and 1881. It stayed in this particular corner of Lancashire. And it's from a lost place name in Halsall, Sherlakers, Sherwalakers. Uh, and you can see how that comes through in the early bearers. Uh, there's one that's sort of Sherwal Atras, but you can sort of basically now in the context of the others, you can see that it's it's a, 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 a yeah, transcription error. That the double T should be double C. So you can sort of see that from the context of it. And uh, whereas most surnames gain an S on the end, uh, that's something I'll, you'll have to read up about why surnames gain S's on the end. That's something I, I, it's too complicated to touch on today. But a lot of surnames gain an extra S. So Mill and Mills, Stoke and Stokes, for example. Um, that's a sort of common post-medieval phenomenon. Um, this one actually loses the S. So Sherwell Acres becomes Sherwell Icker. And you can actually see that happening sort of by, yeah, 1575, the first Sherlocker turns up. So you can see that process of the loss of the S on the end happening. <laughs> Spanner. This is, a re this, is a, this is a really good one. I mean, look at the distribution. It's so... You get 102 in the Isle of Wight and a smattering in Hampshire. I mean, it's so peculiarly Isle of Wight, the surname is Spanner. But um, you only need to turn to uh, Kokoritz's um, book on the place names of the Isle of Wight and you see that there's a place called Span uh, near Roxall in Ventnor and you think oh that's interesting La Span and I mentioned that topographic plus ER is Hampshire Sussex Kent so that fits someone from Span and then sure enough in the poll tax John Atta Span on the Isle of Wight Galfrida Spanner William Spanner in Roxall I mean what better evidence than that could you hope for? I think that's pretty conclusive. Someone from this particular place called Span. Span means a sort of bridge, a footbridge, something like that. So it's someone who came from this place called Footbridge on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> um, and Mitchell Moore. Um, we, we, I mean, we, we, the, the ultimate origin is lost. We can't. We, we, I can't tell you what the what the place was that gave rise to the surname Mitchell Moore, but I can. I can narrow it down to almost one particular parish in South Devon. Um, it's tantalising, but yeah, you can see how it, it stayed in the Kingsbridge area of South Devon right from the medieval period onwards. Uh, yeah, Dittisham, 1380. I mean, that's Dittisham is right is very near Dartmouth, for example. It stayed in this tiny corner of Devon right from from earliest times. So even though we can't pin it down to a particular place, we can almost tell you within sort of five square miles <laughs> where the big meadow or the big big moor was that gave its name, rise to the surname. And in a nod to one of our esteemed VCH colleagues, I thought I'd <laughs> tell you about Tringham because this, this, this gave me endless fun. You think, well, what's the origin of Tringham? Well, I'm pretty confident that it comes from, would you believe, Strencham in Worcestershire, now famous for the Strencham services on the M5 motorway. 
But um, yeah, so the so strings ham, but also I found a document in the TNA catalogue uh, where it was called Stringham in a document of 1337. The place Strencham was called Stringham. Uh, and sure enough, you get Simon de Stringsham, Thomas Strencham of Tewkesbury, that's sort of the effect in the modern form. Um, but you get Strom Richard Stringham, uh, and then Stringham turns up. And then the key, key evidence I've highlighted in red, it, it somehow gets to Herefordshire, which is not a million miles away from Worcestershire, but you get Roger Stringham, 1582, and Elizabeth Tringham, 1589, in the same parish register of Dilwyn, Herefordshire. So you can see that Stringham and Tringham are intimately related, and they're clearly the same surname. Uh, and this loss of an initial S is a common occurrence. If you think of the, the place name Trafford in Manchester, is actually Stratford, Stratford, Streetford, that's lost the initial S. In, it happens in place names as well. The so Stratford to Trafford, and Stringham becomes Tringham. And actually, there is a, a modern surname Stringham that still survives. The S form still survives as a surname. Um, so there you go. I was particularly, particularly proud to have solved the origin of Tringham. I haven't told Nigel yet, but uh, <laughs> I will get around to it one day. Um, and then just to end, this is, this is the last one, I promise. Um, smelt and smelter. I just thought I'd show you how easy it is to beat, beat the, the Oxford English Dictionary <laughs> uh, and to beat their earliest reference. Um, so the, the verb to smelt, as in smelting mel metal, and uh, noun smelter for someone who smelts metal, um, the earliest evidence they give is sort of 15th and 16th century. But look where it comes from. It comes from the Abbey of St. Mary of Fountains. So it's, it's Fountains Abbey, they cite as the earliest evidence for smelting iron and uh, lead, um, lead particularly. Um, that's interesting, yes, a smelter at his lead mines, it says, uh, down here, Nicholas Book, employed, employed by the abbot, at lead mines. So hold, hold that in your mind, hold lead mines and Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire in your mind a sec. And then we look at the surnames smelt and smelter. And sure enough, we see the distribution of smelt, and it's particularly sort of Chesterfield and Peak District Pennines, sort of, yeah, this area of, yeah, upland Yorkshire. Um, and look at it in the poll tax, Henry Smelter, 1337, in Apple Tree Wick, particularly in the uplands there, Roger Smelter in Baslow, Derbyshire. Uh, and these are all places, Apple Tree Wick, Baslow, Asper, they all had medieval lead mines, and some of them were actually the ones owned by Fountains Abbey. Uh, and, I mean, it's, it's not difficult to put two and two together and say that Henry Smelter and Roger Smelter in the poll tax were medieval lead smelters. Um, and so we can beat the OED and say that clearly the noun smelter was being used to mean someone who smelted lead um, in 1377, a whole century at least before the first reference in the, in the OED. So, but of course the OED won't accept surname's evidence as good enough for the dictionary. So. <laughs> we just have to sort of privately know that we can that smelter was was being used much earlier than than the OED might lead you to believe. But smelt, another noun, of course, there's the fish. There's a type of fish as well. And I just put this in. This is from the patent rolls, I think, 1397. John Smelt, citizen and fishmonger of London. So you think, mm, okay, <laughs> maybe yeah, there's a sense too from smelt meaning fish for a fishmonger. Uh, I'm sure that John Smelt, the fishmonger, was, was sold smelt, sold the fish smelt as well. So that's, yeah, you've got to have a sense too saying that it could be from the fish as well. But I think most people with the surname smelt are lead smelters in origin. The end.